Good evening and thanks to all for joining us today. I am Amit Saxena, my colleague Dr. Deepika Chabra from Medical Services, Jackson Park Pharmaceuticals are happy to welcome you all to this scientific session 21 organized by Isobar Prayagraj in association with the Ops and Gynae Societies of Southern India, Allahabad Ops and Gynae Society and Mao Gynae Ops and Gynae Society with academic partner Jackson Park Pharma Limited makers of Divatron 10 milligram tablet of Didrogestron. This webinar is granted ICOG points. This is knowledge sharing initiative of Jackson Paul Pharmaceuticals, makers of Divatron. Fully indigenized micronized Didrogestron, the only brand having 36 months of shelf life. We would like to express our gratitude and warm and hearty welcome to esteemed experts, Hello. attendees, we kindly request you to post your questions, suggestions, explanations via text in Q&A box or chat box. This webinar is streaming live on Facebook and the link is already shared on the chat. We will be sharing the YouTube link for you to watch in the future. Now requesting organizing chairperson Dr. Ranjana Khanna Bam, founder president Isoba Prayagraj, national vice president Foxy 2017, and ICOG Governing Council member to kindly initiate this session. A very good evening. Uh, now, before we begin the session, uh, we fold our hands and pray to Lord Shiva. Good evening and a very warm welcome. Uh, today we are having the second part of Art and Science of Birthing. Uh, you know, our basic uh, aim is uh, obstetrics and gynecology. They are two parts of a subject. And uh, I am a diehard obstetrician. So uh, I continue to take these uh, topics. And uh, uh, I am very, very honored to have as chief guest today, Dr. Anuradha Khanna. Uh, she is the teacher of teachers and extremely learned, extremely vocal person, a uh, very friendly person and a lovely friend. And uh, Dr. Anuradha Khanna, ma'am, we welcome you. And we also have a lot of stalwarts with us. First of all, I am very pleased to welcome the Obstetrics and Gynae Societies of Southern India with us today. And uh, the President, Dr. Jay Rani, is with us. Uh, a very, very pleasing and lovely personality. And we are waiting to hear you. And uh, above all, today we have as one of the uh, speakers, Dr. Haresh Doshi, sir. And uh, I think everybody is looking forward to a revision of uh, pelvic assessment. And uh, we have uh, wonderful chairpersons, Dr. Sunita Tandulwadkar, uh, a dynamic uh, personality of Foxy. And uh, she's one of the uh, contestants for President Foxy this time. And we have Dr. Komal Chawan, a very dear friend. 
and uh, she is contesting for the post of vice president and uh, we have uh, uh, with us dr kundavi shankar and we have uh, my own society members dr chitra pande and dr shubha of course we are the hosts so and we have the mau society president dr kusum verma with us and uh, the secretary dr ekika and the convener of this program is going to be dr parul now uh, i would request dr anuradha khanna ma'am to uh, say a few <coughs> words and to bless this webinar thank you very much dr ranjana khanna for your kind words you are a lovely friend of mine and a big congratulations to you that you have doing a, such a good academic work besides the social you. works also <laughs> and uh, i'm really very nice to see all of you the speakers the chair persons the name already you have mentioned and i'm very much impressed with this obstetrical work because everyone is running after endoscopy and infertility nowadays and they are missing the art of obstetrics especially the how to see the cases how to deliver the cases about the do pelvic assessments they are the basics and very very fruitful things i really love this part 1 also and part 2 is going to be wonderful i'm sure of it with this eminent speakers chair persons and the audience having question answers in it and really once you enter in the labor room it's just click in mind what to do and immediately the partogram is in your mind and the partogram if you remember it is going to cover each and every aspect of a laboring woman and we have to follow strictly and i remember there is also a word known as paperless partogram that is even more important because everything is in your mind and by doing lot of labor room duties the residents are going to be helpful by all this webinars and i really congratulate you all the team of uh, alhaba society the south society and the mau society etika is there amita is there and everyone i'm not going to take all the names and wonderful chair persons and speakers so it is by all warm regards to all of you and not of congratulations thank you very much for your invitation thank you so much ma'am and uh, i i also uh, wanted to welcome dr manju verma ma'am she is with us and she is uh, one of our very very vibrant and learned uh, professors of uh, alabad so i welcome everyone on board and now i would request dr amita to take over the proceedings of the webinar thank you ranjana ma'am and a very warm welcome to from my side also to all the delegates and the faculty to the scientific sangam 21 of isapa prayagraj today we have lined up a three very important topics part two of the art and science of but thing there is a quote by martin fisher that knowledge is a process of accumulating facts and wisdom lies in their simplification so to get these wisdoms from the masters we have with us for the first session the great teacher dr harish doshi sir and to chair the session we have dr sunita tandalwadkar ma'am uh, dr sunita ma'am doesn't need any introduction in this forum she is a great endoscopic surgeon head of department of obstetrics and gynae and uh, ivf center ruby hall clinic pune advisor and consultant of dr dy patel ivf and endoscopic surgeon pune and we all know her great work in stem cell research uh, she has she to her credit she has india's first stem cell baby and world first at the age of 45 baby and she has been president of pune obstetrics and gynecological society she a person founder honorary secretary icsr and president of iag vice president vezon in 2015-17 and uh, she has uh, received various awards i'm not going to enumerate all that welcome ma'am and uh, i would like to invite our next year person dr kundavai shankar she is honorary secretary of obstetrics and gynecological society of south india she is lead fertility consultant IRM MMM successful fellowship program IRM MMM and she is renowned national board certificate obstetrician gynecologist 
and uh, she has various publications and examiner for FNB and MGR University Fellowship Program. I request Dr. Kundavi to please uh, introduce Dr. Harish and welcome him. Dr. Kundavi. Thank you, Dr. Amita. It's my pleasure and my honor to introduce Professor Dr. Harish Doshi, who's the president of Ahmedabad Society 2003 and president of state OBG organization, the state of Gujarat and organizing secretary of AI Suvaji 2000 and chairperson for practical optics committee in 2004 to 2008 and scientific committee chairperson AI Suvaji 2017 at Ahmedabad and Chairperson HRP Conference 2019, Foxy Conference at Ahmedabad. Vice President Foxy Veson 2019 is a governing council member of ICOG 2021 2022. And professors received awards like Gujarat Kinek Excellency Award, Best Teacher Award, Gujarat University, Foxy, Jagdishwari, Mishra, guest lecture and orations at different places. And a lot of publications written, uh, three books and uh, scientific papers member of the editorial board of uh, three journals and faculty of more than 200 times in national international level conferences. Over to you, Professor, to talk about the pelvic assessment. Respected Ranjana Kanna, Madam, Amita, Madam, all other Madams, I should pick out the names, <laughs> Professor Shubha, Madam, Uma, Madam, Ekika, Madam, Jairani, Madam, uh, Kundavi, Madam, and my other chairperson, Sunita, also. If I'm forgetting, because it is a Sangam, it is a Mela, and Mela, somebody is lost always. I like every. So please pardon me if I have not spoken the name, but all the great office wearers of uh, right, Prayagraj, Isopap, as well as Obsidi Ganic Society of Southern India, Allahabad, and Mao Society. Thank you for inviting me for this presentation. And uh, my presentation is like. As Madam Ranjana told, that I am die-hard obstetrician. I am hardcore obstetrician. Hardcore is also a terrorist, but I am an obstetrician, and that's why, right? I will take you to some basics, but the basics are changing now. We are now entering in an era of more, 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 and more cesarean section rather than vaginal delivery. So that that is the reality. Pelvimetry assesses, as you know, the size of a woman's pelvis, aiming to predict whether. She will be able to give birth of a normal size fetus vaginally or not. Very simple, that we know. Okay. The evidence from the literature and experience now says that antenatal pelvimetry is of no value in primary gravida with cephalic presentation. Why so? This was a study almost 20 years back, Black Door and all that. This was a retrospective study, but from the two military hospitals, more than 600 patients. And they concluded that our study indicates that clinical pelvimetry does not change management of pregnant patients. Current practice is to allow all women in a trial of labor, regardless of pelvimetry results. This makes the routine performance and recording of clinical pelvimetry a waste of time, a potential problem, and an unnecessary discomfort for patients. So in a woman and a woman with a cephalic presentation, unless there is gross disproportion, a well-conducted trial of labor is the best test of adequacy of pelvis. Naturally, this practice hinges on the belief that if the fetus is too large to come through, it will lead to arrest of progress of labor. Well, clinical pelvimetry still, ladies and gentlemen, that has a place in obstetrics for predicting or confirming CPD so that one can anticipate and be prepared for proper management of labor. But without appropriate training and repeated practice of this clinical skill, it is now in danger of becoming a lost art. Original Carl and well, right from the undergraduate days, we are learning this classification, but it is not very well accepted. At that time also, there were some right opposition because these pure types are never found in the population. And also, it mainly right, describes the shapes rather than the size. And in labor, we are mainly concerned with the size of the pelvis. We have to in also correlate with the size of the baby. So we are more concerned with CPD rather than pelvis shape or 
also the only size. Also, not only that, the all measurements when we do clinical pelvimetry, only assessment, all measurements are essentially static measurements. But in labor, we, we know that pelvis is not a single bone. It is comprised of many bones held together by cartilages and ligaments. And during pregnancy, the soft tissue attach this soft tissue attachments become more pliable and elastic, giving some space, allowing for progress, descent of the head. So that is there. The sacrococcial movement, as this figure shows, also has some mobility posteriorly, so that the AP diameter of the outlet increases. Also, we all know very well, we are not practicing this position, but the wonderful, we have done, my resident has done a study, the labor in squatting position. It is sometimes difficult to auscultate the fetal heart sound and manage the labor, but it very well, right, helps in delivery of the baby, squatting position. So, labor is a dynamic process, always, not only one factor, static factor, which is very important. Pelvis is a bony passage, most important. But other factors are also important in a right successful outcome of labor. Well, this abnormal pelvis, developmental abnormalities, nutritional problems, trauma and surgery of bony pelvis, diseases of bony pelvis, diseases of lower limb, diseases of spine. Believe me, this is a long list, but all these together make a very small number. We are mainly dealing with a normal pelvis and then the size of that pelvis by our clinical pelvimetry. They are, these are very, very rare in point percentages. And only one that infection part here, that is a polio. Believe me, that half of the polio patients, if you do correct pelvimetry, may deliver normally. So it is not that always polio equal to cesarean section. So all these abnormalities mostly lead to cesarean section, but you have to assess every and individual case so that that particular baby will come out through that pelvis or not. But this guides us, this helps us. So this abnormal pelvis, which I have right listed in the previous slide, you can have this in mind and diagnose them by history, symptoms and signs naturally. So history of injury, surgery of pelvis, past history of even obstetric past history, that is difficult deliveries, instrumental deliveries, failed trial of labor, you will this time always try to assess. General examination, start stature. Again, I will make a remark here. Start stature is not equal to cesarean section. Right? I had a 4 feet 11 inches girl and she delivered a 3.8 kg child. She was also 52 kg weight only. But that, right, God is great, nature is great and always reassess the case. Only thing, as compared to normal height women, there are 5% chances of contracted pelvis more, only 5%. They will deliver normally. So it is not soft stature is equal to scissor section. Gait of the patient, features of rickets, and this dystocia dystrophia syndrome. Because it leads to more android type of pelvis and occipital posterior, it leads to problem, rather than isolated problem of the pelvis. Obstetric examination, when we do in our patient at term, if the head is high floating at term, you are always thinking of that some problem in the inlet. Pendulous abdomen in primary. Normally, a primary has a good tone of the muscle, abdominal mole or uterine muscles, and uterus is held back. But if that becomes pendulous, that means the head is not entering. There is a space problem there, down. And that's why you can, this give, may you give you the clue that you can, you are dealing with a right contacted pelvis. Mal presentation obviously will suggest you that there is some problem in the, there may be some problem in the pelvis. Okay, now, fine. I am giving you the question, right? This is a quiz with a prize. The prize, if you send me the answer by text message, not a WhatsApp. How many types of pelvimetry are there? A, 2, B, 3, C, 4, D, 5, E, 6, F, 7. My mobile number is there. The first two will get the good prizes. I will courier them the prizes. Right, 9825060125. I will wait here for 10 seconds and then I move to next slide. How many total types of pelvimetry are there? 
राइट टू थ्री फोर फाइव सिक्स और सेवन यू गेट द प्राइस फर्स्ट कम फर्स्ट ओके सेंड द टेक्स्ट मैसेज ओनली एंड नॉट द व्हाट्सएप नाइन एट टू फाइव जीरो सिक्स जीरो वन टू फाइव सो मेनी टाइप्स ऑफ एलिमेंट्री राइट वी आर डूइंग ओनली वन एंड वी शुड डू ओनली वन ओनली ओके सो आई थिंक दो राइट ट्राइड आई मूव द नेक्स्ट लाइफ सिक्स टाइप ऑफ एलिमेंट्री सिक्स टाइप्स external elementary this is gone but still i find in my medical college there is a nursing college also the nursing uh, tutor comes with a caliper and measures it is not there external elementary we have uh, stopped long back long back 40 50 years back most important we are doing internal or clinical elementary extra elementary no next slide will tell you why no CT pelvimetry, MRI pelvimetry, okay, okay, but that is not we are routinely doing it. And sono pelvimetry is along with sono cephalometry also. Head size is also to be sonographically assessed. But mostly, mostly we are right only having this our clinical things, our hands, our fingers, internal or clinical pelvimetry. Why X-ray pelvimetry? Okay, so this is the only answer. That is six pelvimetries. Now this for X-ray pelvimetry, Cochrane has uh, five years back only made this uh, review, right? Eleven uh, fifty nine women were included. Five trials were there. Pattinson RC at all, right? What the topic was? Pelvimetry for fetal cephalic presentation at or near term for deciding the mode of delivery. They concluded there is not enough evidence to support use of pelvimetry for deciding on the mode of delivery for women who fetus is a cephalic presentation. But that is for X-ray pelvimetry. Not uh, remember, it is not for cephalic. I mean, clinical pelvimetry. X-ray pelvimetry led to more cesarean section rather than helping in the management of the labor. So Cochrane says X-ray pelvimetry. No, MRI. This is used to as right the dimension of the pelvis and examine the soft tissue of the right mother. Also, it assesses the soft tissue also because MRI. But it is like uh, taking a sword to cut the apple, right? This much thing is not required, right? We are right doing our clinical. We are expert, right? And uh, naturally, I, I should not say, but this this goes with experience. So all seniors, their fingers are more than MRI. I would say more than MRI. Okay, imaging technologies are not as precise as obstetrician would wish or like or want. so don't go for imaging technology for pelvimetry now some tips i cannot take the full uh, right pelvic assessment i should not take rather all our senior grade obstetricians best done beyond 37 weeks or better at the beginning of labor both has advantages and disadvantages you know 37 weeks not before 37 weeks you should never do that right but in labor it is better but then you are delaying the things your planning may be delayed the assessment will be better in labor bladder and bowel naturally empty patient made to lie in a dorsal position with thigh semi flex and separated explain the patient what and how you are going to assess make a relax in a primary patient this is the first time examination and it is right a bit painful discomfort right some of my doctor patients even obstetrician my students when i they come to me for my obstetrics they ask me sir PV is necessary. Say <laughs> they will ask me. PV is necessary. They want to generally PV also. But that, okay, I tell you, this is necessary. Sir, will you do one finger PV? Uh, one finger? How can you assess one finger? You can do PR, not PV. <laughs> two, you require two fingers for PV. So take full aseptic precautions. This is important. Sometimes I have right witness and observing still when I do PV or sometimes even sweeping and all that. it goes for rupture of membranes in next two days leaking of membranes so to be very very full aseptic precautions whenever you do pelvic assessment and also in labor when you do repeated pv infection is always to be prevented is it is said that infection should not be given a second chance right once you think that it is causing the problem you have full full aseptic precaution and once you are in don't uh, remove the finger don't remove i forgot the this part no you have to assess fully pelvis some points 
but cervix, presenting part, station, membrane, everything, everything, everything. So keep your fingers inside. After assessing the pelvis, also assess the things. Clinical pelvimetry. I have right, right, made it compared by six S. Sacral promontory, sacral cow, sec side walls, S, sacrocytic notches, spines, and subpubic angle. Believe me, sacral promontory is for inlet that we'll discuss. But in a primary, if the head engages or at the beginning of labor head engages, the inlet problem is gone. What we are concerned with is cavity. And outlet we can assess very easily. So that middle three are important. Sacral curvature, side walls of the pelvis, and sacrocytic notches. Right. So this is uh, what is for it. It is there. But every level you don't assess anything. In inlet, one only diagonal conjugate. Because you know the transverse diameter in the inlet is more. Always. So your conjugate diameter is good, then transfer has to be good. Right, like that. Okay, I go to that. This is a simple slide. The lines are important. For practical purposes, if AP of inlet and transfers of outlet are adequate, that pelvis is adequate. Right. So AP of inlet, this diameter, which is narrow than this, and transfers of outlet, if it is adequate by your assessment, that the whole pelvis is normally adequate. Okay, for practical purposes, again, if the middle finger, when I examine, if it touches the sacral promontory without lowering my elbow, right, then it is a short AP diameter. If I have to depress my elbow and go more in, then your diagonal conjugate is of good length, 12, 12.5 centimeter, and then you can deduct 1.2 centimeter to get the anatomical conjugate, you can detect 1.25 to get obstetrical conjugate, which is more important. This is not required if the head is engaged, naturally. The inlet is now traversed by the head, okay? So that is, we know this very well. The same is in picture. You can put the finger here and then measurement outside the patient. And then normally we know what is the length. After we become adults, this size is not going to change until becomes we become very geriatric. When we shrunk, shrunk down, that is okay. But up to 90 years, this is going to be same, right? 18 to 90 or say 19 to 90, right? So that you know that your measurement, accordingly you judge, right? For still spines, this is important. Interspinous, not always narrow if the spines are easily fed. Because in the malnourished patient, the fat, vaginal wall thickness may be less and you can easily feel. But that does not tell you that it is because it is easily felt, it is narrow. Actually, the distance between the spines rather than the prominence matters. Okay. Keep the dorsal face anterior. That is important. Now, this is there. When you do this, this way I can move my finger any 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 length, any distance. But if I keep PV like this, this is always a limited separation. So, always only for this thing, you can, for assessment of spines, you can have the dorsal surface. Otherwise, you can have all other assessment of the pelvis by this finger. So that is for interspinous distance. Also, in obese patient, thickness in the everywhere soft tissues. So side walls appear converging, but you have to assess the bony pelvis, right? In a priming gravida, rigid perineum also may mislead you that something is tight, very tight, very tight. No, it may not be this rigid perineum. And uncooperative patients make contract her muscles, civet and I. So you have to make the patient relax. You have to wait, assess it, keep in mind that these are there and don't have right the right wrong. Actual bony pelvis is to be seen. Right. So now the subpubic angle. Fine. So more than two finger, right? Great. That is three finger. Right side figure says great. This always you have to check it, but there are other methods of checking it. Either you keep your two thumbs on the right subpubic arch, two thumbs, or this way, standing on the left side of the patient with right hand on from above, you put your index finger and thumb, right? But if you put the two fingers, first and single middle finger, then it is a narrow. This right side is a narrow. But if you have to do this, this thumb and the index finger, then it is a good subpubic angle, right? You can have right uh, subjective, right uh, 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 interpretation also. But this is narrow when you can do it by your two fingers only. This, these two fingers do not separate more. But thumb 
a thumb and the index finger. These two fingers may not separate more. Same thing, right? Same thing. Soft now, oh, soft tissue resistance. See, pelvis is a bony pelvis. But sometimes you have to also think of the other because baby has to traverse the passage. And passage is made up of bony pelvis as well as soft tissue. So cervix, pelvic floor and perineum. And my teacher used to tell me that if you want to become a good obstetrician, have friendship with cervix. So you always right, have good assessment of the cervix. Thickness, consistency, position, right? Dilatation, effacement, what not, what not. Cervix is a now major factor. Cervical dystocia. Nowadays, many cesarean sections are done for dystocia. Pelvis may be good. So always keep this in mind. And next, power also, right? This is not a pelvis, power. The uterine contraction should be good enough, right? Madam Ranjana is also only taking this, right? The power part of it, right? So good uterine contractions are worth half a centimeter of pelvis. The great Sir Yandural, great inventor of sonography, he only mentioned in one of his books that, right, the great uterine contraction will mold the head, push the head, and even if the pelvis is half centimeter less, so, right, so apart from my clinical assessment, my pelvis, right, I need the help of Ranjana Madam to help that deliver that baby. Well, uh, it was hypothetical that sim uh, now something new before I end. This is something I got from the literature. It was not something uh, new. It was hypothesized that simple placement of peanut ball between right a laboring woman's legs could increase the diameter and allow more space for fetus to descend. This is right trial conducted and already published right, and they have a good results that late antenatal period and pregnancy. This is the peanut ball between the two legs during late pregnancy and early labor. You can have, right? And this will increase. This is like somewhat like not exactly, but skating position, widening the passage and helps in the right delivery of the baby. Peanut ball. Well, ladies and gentlemen, grossly contracted pelvis is rare. Borderline disproportion is increasing nowadays because of many reasons, right? Microsomy and other things, right? Okay. Pelvic assessment guides the planning and management of labor. Clinical assessment should be done better in the beginning of labor, but never before 37 weeks. Pelvic assessment by progress of labor is there. It is assessed pelvis, but it is a retrospective diagnosis. And we want something prospective. So we want to give the prognosis to the patient, relatives, and yourself. Fetal head is the base pelvic matter. I think I have done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harish. Sir, you made it so beautiful uh, that uh, everyone enjoyed the way you speak. Uh, Ranjana, first of all, congratulations to you. What a fantastic way, yaar. I love the mm, name, heading, the birthing. Fantastic. And your love for the obstetric is so palpable. And I was watching you enjoying Haresha each and every sentence. That shows that how much you were involved. Harish, I love the way you presented. It was so simple from your 6S to everything. And believe me, I also strongly believe that whatever aseptic precautions you do, three times in outer aspect, medial aspect, put a lot of sopromycin cream, put very carefully your finger in. But within two to three days, 70 to 80 percent patient comes with the rupture membrane and that's why in my uh, department the rule is no pelvic assessment after thursday i don't allow because they come with the rupture on sundays and i don't like it <laughs> all pelvic assessments are only on mondays and tuesdays in my unit <laughs> Great. Absolutely my, and i was so happy that you spoke the same <laughs> My new girls, when they come now, uh, sometimes the reproductive medicine fellows also. So if they have a time and the patient is lying, they may not know the protocol. They said, ma'am, internal curlew, 38 weeks ago. I said, relax. On Thursday, Friday, we don't do anything inside. <laughs> so uh, I, that's how it is. Uh, thank must, you for this observation. Uh, I must tell that uh, Dr. Sunita, she is not a teacher, but she is like one of us. She is a very good, very good, right? 
uh, teacher, though she's a very great uh, the ART specialist, stem cell specialist, endoscopy specialist, but right, she is a very great teacher also. I wish I told her also that she should be in a medical college. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Doshi, I wanted to say one thing, like yes, uh, it is the general concept that uh, people, I mean the mother-in-laws, they tell their daughter-in-laws towards the end of, uh, after 38 weeks, that pocha lagao pocha and that will be uh, very helpful for uh, normal delivery. So that like is, the squatting, in the squatting position. Squats, the squats are, we are also telling our patients also last few weeks of pregnancy. So that during the actual labor, they can help that thing. And that yeah. helps, that helps. Because primary is an unknown horse, right? So like yeah. the sea does not know. And that is the pain, fear of everything. All stories of friends and relatives after six hours, uh, I could not deliver. My cesarean section was done. The friend was telling her. So that all fear and anxiety is there in her mind. And this sweating, uh, this pocha is for sweating. If uh, our right uh, good uh, 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 middle and high socioeconomical, they will not do pocha, but they will do squats. Squats, they will. Do. <laughs> You know what I tell my patients, see, you know, when squats, uh, if they are not used to now with the three or four only, they get exhausted. I yeah. tell them, take one of your chunni and wash it because while washing, they may not realize that two minutes, three minutes, four minutes. So I tell them all, pocha to koi nahi lagayega. And pocha ko apne washing, isse electric pocha lagayenge, where they don't have to even bend on. But I tell them, wash chunni morning, evening, one chunni to be washed. Yes, After yes. 37 weeks of pregnancy, it helps, it helps. I also uh, enjoyed, Harish, the way you present the entire lecture. I'm, I'm sure your students are very fortunate, Harish. Please. Oh, no, 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 no. No, no. Thank you, ma'am. I love teaching. I love teaching. I teach my students and then force them to learn everything. Uh, I'm looking uh, forward uh, to the further lectures, Ranjana, uh, you and our uh, South Indian beauty, who is an ART <laughs> consultant, Jay Rani, who is going to teach us about the birth. So I'm going to be here with you all. Thank you. <laughs> and Dr. Kundavi, if you, if you want to put in a few words, Dr. Kundavi. That was a wonderful presentation, uh, Prof. I think uh, as an ART specialist, you know, uh, majority of the sometimes the patients go for a cesarean section, but I think you took us through the pelvic assessment and then made us to make sure, yes, every patient can go through whether she's short or tall, I think, to go with the normal deliveries. And I really yeah. enjoyed Sunita Madam saying that she will not do a pelvic assessment on a Sunday. I think it's very true because we would like to have a free Sunday as well. But an obstetrician, I think every day is for us to go with the patients. Thank you, Professor. Exactly. Uh, Dr. Anuradha Khanna, ma'am, would you like to say something? She's president UPCOG at the moment and ex-HOD of BHU. Dr. Anuradha ji. Uh, Ranjana ji, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to listen, Dr. Harish. A wonderful talk. And further, the comment of Dr. Sunita is even more charming with the charming beauty <laughs> on her face. So I love both the things. And really, I also in an agreement that I don't like PVs at all. I like only oh, at the time you follow with the abdomen. And mm -hmm. even initial, uh, once you see the head is entered, the occiput is entered, then you see the first it is at the level, then occiput is entered. Then you start having this partogram. As I said, initially, a paperless partogram is always in my mind. And then I say, now you do maybe two hourly or four hourly uh, per vaginal examination. As Dr. Sunita said, take a sophramycin. I don't like sophramycin. No. I preferably like metandazole gel because what infection actually is having in vagina is anaerobes. And they are very well goes with the metandazole gel. Maybe sophramycin also along with it or even the liquid jalucan jelly is also good because that makes it more not less painful. That so a proper cleaning with the normal saline is even better before your examination. So that is a very, very important thing. I learned when I was GR and I taught my students while I was doing the labor room rounds. And nowadays people are not doing labor room rounds. 
in the evening. This is a very sad story, not even doing the post-op rounds in the evening, not even doing the war teachings. I'm really missing it. I'm telling you the truth, which I'm watching, though I'm retired as an ex-head of department, but still I'm saying the quality of teaching has fallen all over India. I'm sure of it. I think Dr. Harish, you will agree with me. 100%, you are right. Yeah, you are right, so Madam. this is the thing and delivery and obstetrics is an art which already has been mentioned and unless until we will not spend the seniors, will spend the time with the juniors, how will we be able to learn this art? So right. there are so many steps, so many things to learn, even from the patient. The patient is the most, the first one to teach us what to do, what not to do. And the squatting posture, I remember you one story that my mentor, Professor Ramot Prakash, he was there and he said, Ki to CPD lagta hai, I think she may land up in cesarean. And she had uh, three, four deliveries before. The patient said, no, mujko do ita dijiye, two bricks. I will sit down and she sit down on two bricks in a squatting position and be her down and the baby was out. So this, what <laughs> I learned as a GR1 and GR2, 14, yeah. that this is a really wonderful thing. So we have to also see sometimes, I started seeing the patient, not only in lying, rather than sitting position and seeing how much it is going in and what mm. is there. So a wonderful talk by to you, Dr. Harish, and uh, remarkable things. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Ranjana, for the very wonderful sessions. Thank you, sir. It was a mesmerizing talk. It felt like going back to PG class. And thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, another ma'am, for giving your inputs. So moving towards the second session, that is birthing the breach. And today we have speak as a speaker, uh, President of Obstetrics and Gynecological Society of Southern India, Dr. K.S. Jairani Kamraj. And to chair the session, we have very charming Dr. Komal Chuhan. I'll please show her CV. She is Chairperson, Medical Disorder Committee, Zonal Chair Coordinator, FOXI, Chairperson, MOX, Family Welfare, and MTP Committee. She is Senior Consultant in DNB Teacher Unit, Chief VN Desai Hospital, Mumbai. Uh, she is recipient of various awards, like uh, Mr. N. A. Pandit and Mrs. Shalja Pandit Award, FOXI Dhira Award, DK Tank Award, Meruhan Sothi Award, and our next chairperson is Dr. Urvashi Barman Singh. She's professor and head of United Institute of Medical Sciences. And she's received Begum Fatima Kalbe Abbas Award. She has publication in the general uh, awarded best paper presentation in UPCOG. Right now, she is vice president of AOGS. Welcome, Dr. Komal and Dr. Urvashi. I would request Dr. Urvashi to kindly introduce our speaker, Dr. Jayarani. Dr. Urvashi. First of all, I want to give thanks to the ISOPA Prayagraj and <clears throat> Mau uh, uh, Society for giving me the opportunity to chair such a wonderful session. And the topic selected is really good. As Dr. Sunita said, the headings are really charming. Birthing the breach. As we know, uh, breach delivery, 3 to 5% of all term deliveries are breach. And breach delivery definitely needs special skill. For this, we have we Dr. K.S. Dr. K.S. Jaira. Uh, Madam is MD DGO, uh, Diploma Reproductive Medicine from Germany and FICOG. She's Senior Consultant of Reproductive Medicine, Infertility and Sex Sexual Medicine, Director Akash Fertility Center and Hospital, Vada Palani, Chennai. She's president, president OGSSI, Treasurer, PAPI SAR and Associate Secretary of World Association of Sexual Health, Advisory Council Member of a World Association for Sexual Health. She is member of various organizations, ISAR 2015. She is the member of Board of Studies of Dr. MGR Medical University, lifetime member of FOXI, uh, ASRM, and uh, ISAR. She has many medals and uh, awards in a basket. Best Doctor Award by Dr. MGR Medical University, Chennai. Rajamani Jaya Kiran University, first prize in gynecology and obstetrics. Dr. Vada Malian, 
endowment gold medal in MBBS obstetric and gynecological examination, Dr. Ananthichari Prize for being university first in medicine gold medal in DGO, DGO Dr. MG University examination in she stopper from the beginning. Awarded the Women of the Year 2010 by the Lions Club, Achievement of Human Service Award, Exnora 2010, Mega TV Women Achiever Award in 2011, so many awards. Nalam Hospital Women Achiever Award in 2011, and Best Paper Award for Sexual Dysfunction in PCOS Infertile Women, AOFS 2016 in South Korea. Madam. Now you will tell us, brief us about the birthing the breach. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you for the nice introduction. A very special thanks to Ranjana, ma'am, and a very nice occasion to be here with the doins, Dr. Doshi, sir, Sunita, madam, and so many, uh, I mean, uh, good teachers here. And Ranjana, ma'am, really, you gave me a big task of revising breach after a very long time because. See, in our practice, we rarely go for a vaginal breach delivery. We do only in the C-sections to do the assisted breach delivery there. And we don't do it at all. And you gave me a nice homework to, <laughs> <laughs> to revise. And I really enjoyed that, madam. And uh, it is a real pleasure and honor to be here in your forum to speak on this nice topic that is a birthing the breach which is a real challenge to our gynecologists here, really, because Sir has given a very beautiful introduction of how to assist the pelvis. And this breach is a real challenge to assist because we are now into the challenge of how we are going to decide for her, what is the procedure that we are going to do, how we are going to deliver her after it coming ahead, will it but be okay, her cervix will really. dilate, whether her, uh, everything will be a very nice challenge for the obstetrician who looks into her. And to prepare her mentally, her team, her team also to be made very kept ready. At the same time, you have to wait for a long time. All the challenges are there for the obstetrician who desires a vaginal breach assisted delivery, which is a real challenge for the obstetrician who looks into the breach, a birthing a breach for a woman. And it is also a very challenge for the baby to go through the difficult pathway of this assisted breach delivery with all the risk of all the uh, 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 safety problems and also the uh, intracranial injuries and all the other birth injuries which are very high in the breach delivery. So all these are real challenge for all our team and that is the real challenge for us. So before we go into the real management of birthing the breach, let's look into the basics. We all know when the fetus is in the longitudinal line the, or in the podalic pole of the baby is in the lower pole or the buttocks which is present with the legs extended or flexed, we call that as a breach. So when you look at the incidence, when the baby is around 28 weeks, it is only 25%. And when it is 32 weeks in gestation age, around 7% have a breach. And at term, as rightly pointed out by the chairperson, it is 3% of the babies will be in a breach position. And when you come across a breach, the first thing that you should rule out is the problem with the baby. Usually, commonly, it can present with the fetal anomalies, usually a hydrocephalus, or an anomalies in the uterus. Either it could be uterine anomalies or any other fibroids or any mass in the uterus, which may prevent the baby to go for a vertex presentation. And also the liker, if it is more like a polyhydramnias or an oligohydramnias, and preterm babies also will be always in a breach presentation. So it's actually the types of breach that we all know. It's a prank breach where the hips are flexed and legs are extended and the complete breach where the hips and knees are flexed and the foot are not above or are not below the level of the fetal buttocks and the footling breach when one or both feet are presenting at the lowest part of the dress. So these are the various positions we all know. We take into consideration the sacrum as the point of consideration. It could be a left sacro anterior it can be left sacro-posterior, it can be left sacro-lateral, or it could be a right sacro-anterior or posterior or lateral. So these are all the various positions the breech can take in the position. And when you examine any woman with a breech presentation, the important point that you note in her on the inspection, there will be a transverse groove, which may be seen above the umbilicus in the sacro-anterior, which corresponds to the neck of the baby. 
if she is a thin individual you can even see the head of the baby as a round mass just above the umbilicus and we all know the fhr will be heard just above the umbilicus very importantly you have to think of the uh, ultrasound which is a very important mainstay in a breech presentation all women has to undergo a uh, uh, assessment at 36 weeks if she has a persistent breech so it is mainly to detect whether the baby is having an anomaly and also very importantly we have to look into the placenta position and we have to look for the weight of the baby which is very important and about the position of the head is important if the baby's head is extended then we have to be very careful not to allow her for a vaginal delivery so these are all important points that you know down in an ultrasound when you are seeing a breech women a breech baby in a in a term women so how you are going to manage her when in in your antenatal period if you are coming across a women at the 34th week in a multiparous and 32 weeks in a nulliparous you need not do anything just wait the baby can automatically go for a spontaneous version to scaphali but if we are diagnosing after 34 weeks in a multipara and the 32 weeks in a nulliparous the only option you have is an external cephalic version i think i don't know whether nowadays they are doing external cephalic version in the medical college but we were all seeing a, seen a lot of external cephalic version in our pg period the important only one step of treatment which can be given for a, a breach is only a external cephalic version it should be performed at the 36 or 37 weeks and the prerequisites you must rule out a anomaly and there should not be any placental problem and there should not be any previous surgical scar either it could be a cesarean or a myomectomy scar and it is not advised when a woman has other obstetrical risk factors like pih or a diabetes all those things are not allowed for the ecv the highest success rate will be seen in a multiparous women with a who has a good like a volume an average fetal weight baby and it should be a complete breach they are the one which can go for a best success with the ecv the ecv is best performed at 37 or 38 week and that should be the safest technique and that should be done with a close monitoring 50% can have the success rate of getting the version done with the cephalic the conversion of the breech to the cephalic version and it should be done in a relaxed abdomen with an ultrasound guidance with a continuous fetal heart monitoring and the women should not be at rh negative it is also very important even if she is rh negative if she insists give her a dose of anti d at the time so these are all very important one that you should monitor in an ecv and that is the picture of the description of the ecv where they mobilize the breech from below and keep one hand over the vertex of the baby and rotate it with a careful monitoring so that we bring, we bring the vertex down for the presentation so one thing we have to be very careful if there is a fetal bradycardia or if the women complains of pain or if there is any bleeding or draining you should stop the procedure these are because they are all the complications expected with the external cephalic version so definitely 50% can be converted from a breech to a cephal cephalic presentation by this external cephalic version and once you complete that you have to follow this women every week till she get into labor so now once a women come with a breach at term what are the things that you are going to decide either a section or a assisted breach vaginal delivery so how you are going to decide the standard elective cesarean indication for the breach is if the estimated weight is more than 3.5 kg if it is a footling breach if it is a hyperextended head or if it is a complicated breach or associated other problems like plasma previa or contracted pelvis definitely they are indicated for elective cesarean section or if the women comes in the uh, labor she is come with a labor and with complications of variations in the fhr then they are the one to straight away proceed for the cesarean section never advise them to go for a assisted breech delivery so how the mechanism of labor takes place in the breech presentation the three stages one is the delivery of the breech and second is the delivery of the shoulder and third is the delivery of the head these are all the mechanism of labor in a breech presentation so what are the cardinal moments that the fetus undergo during this uh, stages is the first stage when there is a delivery of breech there is an engagement of the bitrochantric diameter they always descend with compaction and then they go for an internal rotation where the anterior buttocks kitches against the pubic symphysis and the baby undergoes a lateral flexion which makes the fetal trunk to come below 
and thereby there is a lateral flexion which makes the posterior buttock to bond first and then comes the anterior buttock. After the delivery of the breech and then the delivery of the shoulders, here the bis acromial diameter engages in the same oblique diameter as the uh, as the uh, peter, as the uh, leg and internal rotation also happens at this stage where the anterior shoulder hitches under the pubic symphysis and the posterior shoulder sweeps in the perineum and they are born first and then the anterior shoulder slips down. Next is the important step is the delivery of the head where the suboccipital frontal diameter of the fetus engages in the opposite oblique diameter other than this shoulder and the breech. The occiput rotates internally and this hitches under the pubic symphysis and the head is born in flexion the face sweeps the perineum and born first. So this is how, this is a picturesque description where there is a breach which is descending down and that is the lateral flexion and then there is a delivery of the uh, breach and then the posterior limb and then the anterior and that's the shoulder getting engaged and descending and the shoulder delivery and that is the vertex coming out. So these are the various steps of the breach delivery. So when you look into the breach, there can be a spontaneous where it is entirely the baby will deliver without any manipulation. Usually it is seen in a very preterm small babies. It is very rarely seen in a normal, I mean term baby. Assisted breach delivery, this is the main important step where the fetus descends spontaneously up to the umbilicus and then the rest of the fetus is extracted using additional maneuvers. Total breach extraction, when the baby is in distress, we go for this type of a fetal extraction. So the criteria to decide for the vaginal breech delivery is when there should be a complete or frank breech. The estimated weight should be roughly between 2 kg and to 3.5 kg. And the baby should have a flexed head and there should not be any complication. So when you are planning for an assisted breech delivery, always you should keep the obstetrician skill. You have to be very, very clear that the skill of the obstetrician is very important and you should have all the facilities of continuous fetal heart monitoring and the neonatologist should be on call and all the facilities are there for emergency c-sections and also the forceps should be kept for a uh, delivery of the after coming head and important guidelines you have to make is you have to be very clear about counseling the patient and the attenders the patient should be briefed about the procedure the prolongation of the time the emergency can be taken for cesarean section and also about how she should cooperate during the procedure. Everything should be properly counseled and she should be mentally prepared, which is very important. And the attenders should be counseled about all the risk factors and complications which they can come across. And that should be given as an informed written consent, which is very important. And in breach, there is no induction of labor. It should not be induced. And always never do an early ARM because we want the cervix to be fully dilated. That will prevent the obstruction of the after coming head. So you have to do only a late ARM or a spontaneous rupture is always there. And oxytocin augmentation usually should be avoided. Always maintain a partogram. That is very important. So once the assisted breach delivery happening, you have to keep all these things as a checklist. The anesthetist should be there or a good assistant should be there to help you when you deliver the uh, after coming head that they are to be well trained in giving a proper uh, pushing, uh, I mean, uh, uh, assistant should push the fundus. They should be well trained in that and well briefed about the procedure. And all the instruments for the surgical things should be kept ready. The obstetric forceps should be kept ready and all the trays should be ready for the revival of the baby, which is very important. Very importantly, never rush never pull from below, never push from above unnecessarily. Always keep the fetus with the back anteriorly. So how we are going to deliver, that's very important. It always requires a skilled obstetrician and a very able assistant who can complete this delivery, which is very important. And a neonatologist should be there, a forceps should be there. Very importantly, you have to have an alert timing because the duration between the delivery of the fetus up to the umbilicus and the delivery of the mouth is very crucial and that should take only two to three minutes and should not exceed five minutes. So these are all the important things that you should keep in mind and how we have to do, which is very practically important. I want to just tell a brief thing. When the breach is visible in the introitus, you, you are not supposed to do any PV at all. 
wait for the breach to descend. You can monitor per abdomen for the descent. And once the breach is visible in the introitus, put the patient in the lithotomy position, which is very important because that will prevent the iota cable compression and helps the baby to de descend still more better. Don't touch, just wait and bring her to the edge of the table and clean her, catheterize her bladder and all the other things to be kept very ready is the pudendal uh, block, which is very importantly can be done when the breach is almost well moving up in the perineum. That is very importantly at the time of climbing in the perineum, when the breach starts climbing the perineum, you can inject the um, uh, pudendal block, which is very importantly should be done with care because after that it is very difficult you can do. So at the time when the breach climbs the perineum, you can give a very liberal episiotomy, which is very important because this can prevent a quick compression and release of the head during delivery and prevent an intracranial injury and asphyxia. And also it helps to delivery of the shoulder and arms and after coming head. That is a very important thing that you should keep in mind. And also you must always, once the baby starts delivery, you have to hold the femoropelvic grip which is very important. We have to keep the finger on the femur pelvis and the thumbs being on the sacroiliac region. A gentle traction can be given as the uterine contraction and pressure, the baby should descend down and you can take a loop of the cord and keep it separate and wait till the lowering angle of the scapula is visible. After that time, there will be the delivery of the shoulder and the arms. Using the femoral pelvic grip, the trunk should, should be rotated. Maybe the shoulders can occupy the anteroposterior diameter at the pelvic inlet. Then the shoulder can be delivered first depending on the convenience. Usually the posterior shoulder is delivered first and then the anterior shoulder comes behind. So then comes the important point that is the delivery of the after coming head. This is the most important stage of the delivery. Not more than 10 minutes, preferably ideally less than 5 minutes should be the time given between the delivery of up to the umbilicus and to the head to reduce the fetal asphyxia. The key factors are gradual gentle descent and flexion of the fetal head, protection of the cervical spine from excessive traction and of the fetal head compressing and decompressing. This is very important. You have to give a very gentle but it should be a very gradual and it is always should facilitate the flexion of the fetal head, which is very important point that we should always keep in mind. So the fetus should always be allowed to deliver spontaneously till the umbilicus. The fetus, the feet may be hooked out if required. The fetus must be held by placing the thumb on the sacrum and the index fingers on the iliac crest, the femoropelvic grip. The back of the fetus should face the obstetrician always. A loop of the cord should be gently pulled and down and kept on one side. When the inferior angle of the scapula is visible, the anterior arm may be helped out by bringing it down over the chest, simultaneously rotating the fetus a little forward on the opposite side. The aftercoming head is always delivered by any one of the maneuvers only when the hairline or the nape of the neck of the baby is visible. Till that time, don't give any undue traction and that will have a lot of effects. So these are the stages that you wait for the full dilatation till the descent of the breach will have, naturally it will happen very comfortably, it will come across. When the buttocks become visible and begin to distend the perineum only, you have to prepare the women for the delivery. Till that time, don't touch her. The buttocks always will lie in the anteroposterior diameter, and then only when you see the anterior buttock being delivered, then only the anus will see hitching over the foreshit, and then you have to give a episiotomy. That will help to deliver the breach, the legs, everything properly. If the legs are well flexed, they will deliver spontaneously. But if they are extended, they may need to be delivered using certain maneuvers. The usual maneuver we do is the peanuts maneuver when it is extended. But if it is well flexed, it can be hooked out and can be delivered with a proper assessment. So the peanuts maneuver, I want to say a few words. Always use two fingers to exert pressure on the back of the knee of the fetus, or that, that is on the popliteal fossa, and guide the thigh away from the trunk as the trunk is rotated in the opposite direction. This causes the knees to flex and allow the extrusion of the foot and leg. This is the same procedure can be repeated if needed to deliver the other leg also, if it is an extended way. So that is the peanuts maneuver, how we go up with the two fingers, hitch the popliteal fossa, which will make the legs to flex and slip out and then do the same thing on the other uh, leg also to deliver it. And deliver of the shoulders, the baby 
will be lying in the shoulders, the transverse diameter of the pelvic mid cavity. As the anterior shoulder rotates and the anterior posterior diameter, the spine of the scapula will be visible. At this point, a finger gently placed above the shoulder will help to deliver the arm. As the posterior arm should reach the pelvic floor, it too will rotate anteriorly in the opposite direction. And that will be very similar to the Lausette maneuver, which we always try to do. And that is the description of the Lausette maneuver, by which what we do is, we, the fetus is always kept by the femoropelvic grip and turned one fourth of a circle, that is around 90 degree, keeping always the back a little uppermost, the, so that the sacrum faces laterally. The downward traction is gently applied at the same time, so that the arm that was posterior becomes anterior and can be delivered under the pubic arch. The delivery of the arm is done by placing one or two fingers on the upper part of the arm and the arm is drawn over the chest as the elbow is flexed and the hand sweeping over the face of the fetus. The deliver the second arm, the baby is next turned half circle, that is 180 degree in the opposite direction, keeping the back uppermost, always a little, always you should do, keep it always uppermost, applying a little downward traction. The second arm is delivered in the same way. So that is the Lausette maneuver. And if the baby's arm, that is it's a posterior arm is little extended, with the anterior arm slips out and the posterior arm is little extended, then you have to go, you have to grasp the fetus by the legs and pull towards the mother's side. That will make the uh, posterior arm approachable or easily for the obstetrician to reach. So she puts the other hand and introduces the sacral hollow of the posterior arm to the fetus to the elbow. It, it will reach the elbow of the fetus, then it will make the fetus elbow to flex so that it will slip out and then it can be delivered. So that is the way that we deliver the um, sorry, that will deliver the posterior extended arm. So if the baby's hand is in the nuchal area, that is if the arm is flexed at the elbow with the forearm behind the occiput, that is in the nuchal point, this is a very important point that you should feel and palpate. The, to relieve the nuchal arm, the fetus should be rotated in the direction in which the nuchal arm points and so that the fetal face always should face towards the pelvic side wall. There should be a friction little exerted on the vaginal wall, allow the elbow to get free and drawn towards the face, thereby freeing the arm. This is the very important step that you should do to relieve the nuchal position of this arm. So the next is the important step. Now we have delivered up to the shoulder, allow the baby to hang with his own weight and cover the baby. That's very important. That's a savage maneuver. You have to keep the baby covered. That will prevent the external stimulation of the uh, respiration, which may get the baby asphyxiated. So you have to cover the baby, and that will also prevent the dehydration of the umbilical cord. This is called as a savage procedure. And then you have the important step of delivering the head. The delivery of the head can be done in three methods. You can do a Burns Marshall technique, or you can use a Morris's Melly Wheat technique, or you can even do a Prax technique. When whichever way you are comfortable, you have to do. And always, if you are very comfortable with the forceps, Piper's forceps, you can do a Piper's forcep. So the Burns Marshall technique, the baby is allowed to hang by its own weight. When the hairline is visible under the pubic arch, the assistant gives a suprabubic pressure that's very important. That will help to flex the head. That what we call as a Cristilla maneuver. The baby's trunk is gently lifted swung towards the mother's abdomen through an arc of 180 degree, hold the baby just above the ankle and the left hand, this is by the right hand, and the left hand should support the perineum. So this is a very important technique that you do. That's a Burns Marshall technique. This will help to deliver the baby very comfortably the after coming here. If you have still more, you feel a little difficulty, then you can go for the Marcy Smelly Beat technique. Here, the baby will be held astride on the left forearm of the obstetrician. The index and the middle finger will be kept on the malar eminence and the middle finger will be put into the mouth to promote the flexion. And the other hand, that's the right hand, ring and the forefinger should be placed on the baby's shoulders and the middle finger should press the occiput to facilitate the flexion. At the same time, the assistant should give a pressure. The crystallar pressure should be given in the suprapubic area which will also facilitate the flexion, which is very important. And then that will help the baby to deliver out with the flexion. So as the mouth is visualized, immediately we have to suck the mouth and the nose, which will deliver the without a proper, I mean, without any asphyxia or aspiration. 
So the next method is the posterior rotation of the head. That is the Prague method. And another method is the Prax maneuver. This is all the method where you can help out if the baby is still having a difficulty. The breech is delivered exactly. It is kept swine over the abdomen. And with the thighs flexed and with the suprapubic pressure, the baby can be delivered by this Prax maneuver. And we all should know how the pipers forceps, when you are planning for a breech delivery, always get used to the pipers forceps. This pipers forceps is a different forceps which has a longer shank with a pelvic curve to help to protect the head. Always it will keep it in a flexed position. That's a very important one. And always the backward curve of the shank makes them more convenient to use because the baby's body does not have to be elevated as high to keep it up off the way of the handles because sometimes it's very difficult as the baby hangs you can't apply the forces so then assistant hold the baby with a tie just lift it up so that the obstetrician will put the uh, shank of the blade that will help the pipers forceps to flex the baby's head and to deliver don't lift up the baby too high because that may create a lot of neck and the cervical spine injury that should be avoided so if there is a entrapment because if the baby's head comes without a full dilatation, then you have to be prepared for the durescence incision. It is always done at the six, 2 o'clock position, 6 o'clock and in the 10 o'clock position. Always keep everything ready for this incision because don't waste time. Don't unnecessarily pull. Immediately do the durescence incision. That will help the baby to slip out very easily. That is a very important. All should be trained when you are doing a procedure. should be trained on this incision, which is very importantly to be done. So all these things will keep in mind all the injuries that the baby can go through. So make everything faster, quicker, decide everything proper, do a good mock delivery procedure before you plan with your, uh, before delivering a breach. Ask your assistant and help them out how they have to do, how they have to do the procedure. Everything has to be well trained. And always an anesthesia team should be ready. So these are all the take-home messages. Once you deliver the baby, right, the neonatologist is going to take care and you're going to inspect all this uh, injuries, everything that is different. But these are the stages that you should keep in mind when you're birthing a breech baby. So all these things are very importantly done with complete patience. You cannot do anything on urgency at all. So the very important step that you have to keep in mind is the counseling part. Both the patient and the attenders has to be counseled about the pros and cons and the difficulties and their cooperation is very important and get a proper consent and never induce a breach, you know, a, no induction for the breach and always never go for an ARM. It, let it be a spontaneous rupture of membranes and never hurry in doing any procedure for a woman in a, with a breach. Leave the breach to come of its own. Never pull or push never pull from below or push from above make sure that the baby's fetus baby back should always be facing anteriorly never it should always obstetrician should see the back of the baby always that is very important and time limit never give any time limit wait 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 but only one thing after the delivery of the breech till the umbilicus you should be very quick in delivering the after coming head and make sure that the baby is well taken care of by the neonatologist so these are all the important points that you should keep in mind when you birth a breach. So birthing a breach, it is really a challenge. And if you do it, you will really achieve the greatest medal. That's what I usually uh, say when we did the breach deliveries uh, in our post-graduation time. And it is very, very important that you should be very, very uh, planned everything properly. And you have to keep a good team so that you can do it with comforts. A very important thing, the obstetrician skill, and they would have had a previous breach delivery, they would have done, and all the, I mean, all the team has to be ready for all the emergency sections also. So with this word, I thank uh, Kana Madam and the Isa for giving me this opportunity to share about the birthing, the breach. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam. Yes. I think Wonderful. Mr. Jani. <laughs> Fantastic and fabulous talk. Wonderful, you know, wonderful. Yes, wonderful because breach is a subject wherein now uh, people are little, they have some phobia or fears of delivering it vaginally. Gone are the days where we have delivered so many breach. We have 
seen it being done so comfortably and now i tell my uh, juniors uh, even a multi breach no madam we are scared about the birth injuries last time we had to pull a lot you know they are they have their different everybody has a different fear it becomes very difficult to remove them some people uh, feel that yes uh, i i couldn't deliver some people will come with a fear that last baby had some birth injury or i heard something had happened somewhere you know so those concepts are going on everywhere and the fear of birth injury is adding to it it is very simple as the take home messages which you enlisted was so apt if you go by those i think most of the breach you don't have to do you more the, the, all the maneuvers which are practically described are not used for every breach you know people get scared thinking that probably i have to do this maneuver and i may not be able to do and i i will land up into problem but it is not there for every breach you don't have to do assisted breach delivery or a breach extraction for everything most of the breach will deliver normally till the umbilicus and you don't have to do any thing believe me i keep telling them that just allow the baby to deliver and just guide and just try to see the arm one by another the anterior and it comes out every time we have to teach and uh, teach the breach is the b- most important thing and you spoke very well and i'm really happy dr ranjana khanna madam dr anuradha khanna and amita sharma and all the team of icpa prayagraj to keep breach as a topic because we have to revive this art because now the the indications for cesarean section and we don't want this multi breach to be on a rise i i think yeah. it's really great i'm hearing the second talk of a breach in this week we had in mumbai obstetric gynecology dr frank lowen who came and gave the oration and now breach looks very simple you know after jaira no but uh, it's a nightmare if the head after coming head gets arrested that is yeah. a nightmare yeah we need to just assess <laughs> then Sometimes we need to know all the maneuvers yes we, we need, need to, to know all it the maneuvers because of obstetrician panic more you know rather than the yeah i yeah. still i still remember where, when we did the last breach i really waited more than 5 hours even the breach was in the perineum it was just coming and going we didn't touch it at all that yeah. makes the delivery easy yeah, and comfortable yeah. no yeah, if, you, if you if you keep it not supposed to touch them the no. interns everybody they were very anxious madam why don't you pull it why don't you so much it's no. i said stop let's wait no the, i just want to add one thing first of all congratulation dr jaya rani for such a wonderful talk on the breach as we used to teach to our students and not only for the vaginal delivery the skill of breach is very important for cesarean at yes. times you are delivering the baby by breach you have to do assisted maneuver to deliver the head and hands so the skill of breach is very important to teach our yeah. students properly dr harish if you could give uh, your uh, views and dr manju and ma'am <laughs> yeah before dr harish sir we covered the whole topic i was there Uh, and dr komal gave a, a comments and the most important thing as madam jayarani mentioned that the it is dr dilly has mentioned that the most difficult thing in a vaginal delivery is to sit silently it is the eating of the dog and then they enter the right before it is required let the breech deliver up to umbilicus right and then and he has also said that how will you rate the obstetrician let me see him or her conducting a vaginal breed delivery and i will give his or her obstetric rating how great obstetrician he is and for after coming head as you mentioned nightly in a nightmare the what happens with the resident that one <laughs> baby they deliver and then there is some problem so they get right that memory and that fear and seriousness yeah. and next time they pull it more <laughs> the air is not required so you miss a cycle it is because the negative vicious cycle that then enter in a more soup right exactly as, soon as the labor room breach comes the residents are right multiparous breach primary we do cesarean section they are thrilled then then that that breach uh, they gives a, that feeling to them uh, that is not right nature is great and we have seen delivered breach without our help you are without assisted assisted is the ideal thing but without assisted in a labor room and there are so many patients before we delivered this patient that breach came out right so that is also another part of the story for after coming head one thing i would say i am doing the forceps also right for after coming head i have done few but oblique keeping the baby in a oblique diameter as my pelvis talk comes now 
that from inlet to outlet, the oblique diameters are same, 12, 12, 12. So keep the baby rather than back anterior slightly oblique and then deliver, you may be able to deliver, right? So that is there. I think uh, very good and also one thing that uh, I just learned from the last oration of Dr. Frank Lovin that maternal positioning also helped a lot in mm. conducting breech yes. delivery. Uh, yes. That uh, for the natural breech delivery, like just allow the baby to deliver and a choice like putting the mother in the uh, on the four legs and you know that positioning also helped in assisting and maintaining the dilatation actually. What we are more fear, fearful sometimes is that the breach can come out a leg or sometimes come, come out in a not full dilatation. And then we may have some uh, part of the baby coming out and, and then somebody will try to pull in through that, you know, the full non-fully non dilated cervix and then they land up into a problem. So that is the most important thing is the late ARM, why we talk, that, that not to do anything till the baby is delivered in umbilicus. That makes so much sense because once you see, Are, kuch to bahar nikla, kuch to bahar nikla. Ja, okay, kicho, kicho. so all that creates a lot of disturbance everywhere. <laughs> that is that is really, and, oh, and the fear, ki somebody has said it's a breach, the mindset, because believe me, if you follow all, even the after coming head becomes easier and Piper's concept, I think Dr. Harish has a, a great uh, knowledge, but if you do the maneuvers properly, you know, any of the maneuver, I think uh, the breach delivery is easy. If it is well, you know, well planned from the beginning. If it is yeah, done, if you are well aware, yeah, if and well uh, a proper I mean, obstetrician and all should be there. And Jairani, that was an excellent talk. And Dr. Manju Verma, ma'am, any comments? I differ from all of you a little. <laughs> um, because you just cannot assess the head and the pelvis, you know, the CPD cannot be assisted. So one has to keep the fingers crossed. One should know the fetal weight initially. If the fetal weight is much more, the likely chances that the baby is bigger. And in that case, one should not try a vaginal delivery. Mm -hmm. Number one. And the other thing is this breach. Otherwise, if it is a small baby, small baby. what happens is uh, uh, that it will slip out. The body will slip out till the acrom uh, till the shoulders within completely dilated cervix. And then what to do? So I want people to answer then what to do. So uh, that is, we <laughs> give cervical relaxation. If it is a multi patient, cervix, as we know, sometimes in second stage dilates, I mean, the labor dilates so fast that epidocin we have used. And only one time I've given Drusen's incision. Drusen's incision for forecoming head is a problem because when you put the cut, deliver the head and then shoulders come out, the tear extend upwards. But here exactly. the is, only the head is remaining. So hmm. and season does not extend much, but hmm. not many times I've done only once, but that baby was saved. But at least you can give cervical relaxant on NTG dream. NTG, if you are there in a medical college, it is very well easily done. Otherwise, epidocin you can give. But you are right, yes. as Komal also mentioned, that preterm breach is a headache problem. It comes out, comes out, and then you are in a entering in a problem. Yes. Even even giving the like to deliver a primary also. Relax, madam. We are not talking about primary. <laughs> oh. we, we want to prevent the multi breach. I think we should not go yeah. to the primary. No, breach. No, no, confusion. no confusion. No confusion. No confusion. No confusion. No confusion. <laughs> Hundred percent breach. Yeah, and and I'm using hundred percent breach. That was a tricky team. question, uh, Doctor Verma, ma'am. That was a tricky <laughs> question by you, and we all don't agree for a primary. <laughs> no. And routinely, we have and all delivered many. Unless but uh, now, unless, now. Doc, unless Doctor Doshi, she comes delivering the breach delivering, only yes. first time. I mean, she is the primary, but first time she's come to your clinic and she's already full dilatation. Still then she doesn't yeah. have any option. By the yeah, time to, the obstetrician, uh, no, the still section, up yeah. to umbilicus, you can take the decision for cesarean section. Up to yes. umbilicus. Yes, you can not still take Even yes. if she comes full dilated, because I yeah. think we should not take four go. minutes. Four yes. minutes to take out the baby. Yes. Yeah, yes. Because because what we have, we have enough scientific evidence tomorrow. If you land up into problem doing a primary breach section, yes, it's always better to take her up, uh, even if she's fully dilated. But uh -huh. multi gravida, we can because the evidence lie in our favor and we can yeah. definitely go and ahead. Even and even in twins, you know, how many the studies second are there? 
how many studies are there that the intellect intellect is compromised if you deliver is there any studies available like that no when you do intellect i i have not gone across but i think birth injuries were little extra uh, Uh, Because this, nowadays people have one or two children with one children with a compromised intellect, uh, I think it will be a problem for the parents. Yes, yes. So, madam, once we start counseling itself, they will say, "Madam, take for a cesarean yeah. section." Yeah, actually, 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 actually What one one study. Sorry, madam. Breach. Sorry, madam. I am telling one thing. Uh, yeah. There is one study. I don't remember just now. If baby or breach deliveries, they cry a bit later. Half a minute, one minute it takes. So five minutes of car is normal. If there is no immediate asphyxia, then there is no intellectual problem. But if like in a vertex delivery, if the baby is asphyxiated, and then we are worried of whatever ischemic encephalopathy. that is there but long term study as dr manju madam asked is not, not there but 5 minutes upgar if it has come down to normal then there is no problem yes madam komal yes i just wanted to know the role of perimetry in breach so uh, that is always there as madam mentioned yes. so it is not only pelvis it is always your the baby weight you have to consider so yes. all criteria for vaginal breach delivery yeah, baby is very important, important. And, <laughs> that's what is your, your question is right Roomy pelvis. I don't want a adequate pelvis. I want a roomy pelvis, right? And then type of breech and size of the breech, a weight of the baby, and gestational age and parity and everything other. But roomy pelvis. Okay. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jarani, ma'am, and everyone for making this discussion very interesting. And with this, I request Dr. Parul Khanna, founder, communicator of Isopar Bhayagraj, and consultant Nova IVF. Jory Garden, Delhi, to take on the next session. Dr. Parul, please. Now we move on to our third session. It is a talk by our founder, president of Isopar Prayagraj, Dr. Ranjana Khanna, ma'am, and the topic for the session is abnormal uterine action, hindrance in natural birthing. I would like to invite the chairpersons for the session. Uh, ma'am is president, Mau Ops and Gynae Society, director Ashish Nursing Home. Ma'am has so many uh, recipient of so many awards, Chikitsa Ratan Award by UPN Con, Best President IMA Mau, Appreciation Award for Social Work by Inner Wheel Club. Her special interests are emergency ops care, high risk pregnancy, and cervical cancer. Our next chair chairperson is Dr. Chitra Pandey, ma'am. He is director and consultant OBGYN at Harsh Hospital, Allahabad. Uh, Ma'am is fellow of Indian College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. She is Vice President Isopar Prayagraj. She has been Honorary Secretary of Allahabad Ops and Gynae Society. She has been organizing Secretary of National Conference of Foxy Obdil 2020, and organizing committee member of various national conferences. I now uh, welcome you, Ma'am, and I request Dr. Kusum Verma, Ma'am, to in. Uh, give her expert comments and Dr. Chitra, ma'am, to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ranjana Khanna. Thank you so much, Parul, for kind introduction. Though our next speaker, Ranjana Khanna, ma'am, she doesn't need any introduction, but is all we always feel very proud whenever we have to introduce her. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for selecting such wonderful topics for all our scientific sangam. And today's topic is also very very interesting. Uh, so. Uh, Uh, Madam is uh, National Vice President Foxy 2017. She is also founder president of Priyagraj Chapter of Isopar from 21 to 23. She is at present she is ICUG Governing Council member 2021 to 23. Uh, she has been president of AOGS from 2013 to 2016. Uh, Madam has organized various national conferences including obstetric dilemmas. Uh, 2022 BOH Priology Sevma uh, 2016. Uh, we have uh, witnessed that how wonderfully she has organized all the conferences. She has been faculty at various national and international conferences and webinars. Uh, Madam uh, is has achieved many national awards, including Foxy Dira Award 2022, and she has been felicitated by many societies of Foxy. So it. Now it's 
थैंक यू सो मच चित्रा फॉर दिस ओके नाउ आई शेयर माय स्क्रीन न अ वेरी गुड इवनिंग आई एम गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग सब्जेक्ट एंड दैट इज एब नॉर्मल यूट्राइन एक्शन नॉर्मल लेबर यू नो कैरेक्टराइज बाय कोऑर्डिनेटेड यूट्राइन कंट्रेक्शन associated with progressive cervical dilatation and descent of the fetal head this cervical dilatation is normally to the tune of more than 1 cm per hour in nulli para women in the active phase of labor this is likely to end in successful vaginal delivery normal uterine contractions polarity of the uterus see actually i'm talking about the normal because if you don't know the uh, normal we can't appreciate the abnormal polarity of the uterus when the upper segment contracts the lower segment relaxes there are two pacemakers which are situated at each cornu of the uterus and they generate uterine contractions in a coordinated fashion the properties of normal uterine contractions the intensity of contraction diminishes from top to bottom of the uterus the contraction wave starts at the pacemaker propagates towards the lower uterine segment the duration of contraction diminishes progressively as the wave moves from the pacemaker in dysfunctional labor new pacemakers may come up anywhere in the uterus so how do we define normal uterine action any deviation of the normal pattern of uterine contractions affecting the course of labor is designated as disordered or abnormal uterine actions please mute everyone else now the um, effect of the uterine contraction starts at the uterine cornu and gradually sweeps downwards what is primary dysfunctional labor uterine activity instead of being governed by a single dominant pacemaker is shifted to less efficient contractions due to emergence of other pacemaker foci in primary dysfunctional labor this is defined when the cervix dilates less than 1 cm per hour following a normal latent phase of labor this is the commonest abnormality mostly corrected by arm and or oxytocin augmentation secondary arrest is defined when the cervical dilatation stops or slows after the active phase of labor has begun normally the uterine activity can be measured by basal tone active peak pressure and frequency of contractions and how is this done by clinical palpation which is inaccurate tocodynamometer with external transducer using intra uterine pressure catheter which is very accurate but it is an invasive procedure so not normally done normal baseline tone is between 5 and 20 mm of mercury and peak pressure is around 60 the incidence 25% in nulli para women and 10% in multi para now uh, what are the causes it could be unknown prevalent in elderly primary prolonged pregnancy over distension of uterus emotional factors sometimes the patient is very strung out obese contracted pelvis and malpresentation injudicious administrations of sedatives analgesics and oxytocics premature attempt of vaginal delivery and instrumental delivery now what are the types of abnormal uterine action they could be with the normal polarity or with the abnormal polarity coming to the abnormal actions with normal polarity could be hypotonic uterus or hypotonic uterus hypotonic uterus is uterine inertia hypertonic uterus could be precipitate labor tonic uterine contractions and retractions now coming to the normal polarity spastic lower segment colicky uterus asymmetrical uterine contractions constriction ring generalized tonic contraction cervical dystocia all these come into in coordinate uterine contractions so these are some pictures which show us the types of uh, contractions so this is the first picture a shows us a normal contracting uterus and b shows abnormal foci coming up in c we see this is again normal the fundal dominance is there d shows no foci no contractions anywhere so this is inertia in e we have asymmetrical uterine contractions in f we have uh, dominance in the lower segment so it is the spastic lower segment and in g we have a colicky uterus there are pacemaker foci at four five places and h is cervical dystocia so coming to these one by one first of all uterine inertia this is normal polarity hypotonic 
uterine contraction. This is very common. Uh, actually, it's quite common. It can complicate at any stage of labor, may be present from the beginning of the labor or subsequently develop after a variable period of contractions. Uterine contractions, the dim, uh, intensity is diminished, duration is shortened, there's relaxation between contractions, intervals are increased of the relaxation. Now, the general pattern of uterine contractions of labor is maintained, but the intrauterine pressure is always less, below 25 mm. So, how do you diagnose? Patient feels less pain during contraction. If you place the hand over the uterus, you can feel that it is not very well hardened. Uterine wall is easily indentable at the height of the pain. Uterus remains relaxed after contraction. Fetal parts are well palpated and the FHR remains normal. So internal examination, we see that uh, the dilatation of the cervix is very poor and there could be, mind you, contracted pelvis, that is CPD or malposition, deflexed head, malpresentation, which has been missed previously. Membranes usually remain intact. Effects on the mother, the mother gets exhausted, but fetal distress comes on later. Now, how do we manage? We do a cesarean section if there is malpresentation or CPD and uh, evidence of maternal or fetal distress. And vaginal delivery, you have to keep up the morale of the patient. Explain to her that it's taking time, but we'll come by it. And avoid supine position because the blood supply to the fetus is hampered. Catheterize the patient, maintain hydration, and adequate pain relief is given. Now, active, uh, measures are taken for the vaginal delivery because she's not having any contractions. Acceleration of the uterine contraction by ARM and oxytocin drip. The drip rate is gradually increased until effective contractions are set up. And then the drip is to be continued until one hour after delivery. This is very important. Otherwise, she may land up in PPH. Now, hypotonic uterus, the overactive uterus, that is precipitate labor. Now, this, uh, what is precipitate labor? When the uh, combined first and second stage of labor and the delivery is complete in less than two hours. It is common in multipara and is repetitive. Rapid expulsion is due to combined effect of hyperactive uterine contractions associated with diminished soft tissue resistance and of course a roomy pelvis. Labor is short, rate of cervical dilatation five centimeters per hour or more in nullipara. So what happens? Maternal complications could occur, extensive laceration of the cervix, vagina, perineum, PPH, because such fierce contractions were taking place. And after the expulsion of the baby, suddenly the uterus relaxes. So PPH is bound to occur. Inversion of the uterus, uterine rupture, infection, amniotic fluid embolism. What about the fetus? The fetus is exposed to a lot of risk. Why? Because there's no time for the fetal uh, head to get, there's no time for molding of the fetal skull. So ICH is bound to occur in these patients. And if the patient is standing and suddenly she gets a contraction and the baby falls to the ground, then what happens? The umbilical cord gets torn and the baby with the head falls on the floor. So there's damage to the skull and the baby can also die. So uh, how do we manage? If there is a history, because this there are chances of repetition in this case. So if the patient is, has a previous history of precipitate labor, she should be hospitalized prior to the labor. During labor, the uterine contractions can be suppressed by administering ether or magnesium sulfate during contractions. Delivery of the head should be controlled. Don't let it come out very fast. Give a liberal episiotomy. And you can induce by rupturing membranes, but do not give oxytocin. Now, coming to the other part of the hypertonic uterine contractions, tonic uterine contraction and retraction. Now we are referring to the bandel's ring, which is the pathological retraction ring. And I remember all of us, have seen and read so much about this because this is commonest, uh, commonly seen in obstructed labor. 
So the obstetrician should be very sure that this patient can be induced. There is no CPD, there is no malpresentation, and then only go ahead because otherwise you will land up in this condition. The, there is gradual increase. What happens in this, that there's increase in intensity, duration, and frequency of the contraction. The upper segment contracts and retracts. It's trying to push the baby down. And the lower segment thins out. It's tender. It's trying to take up the baby. But it's unable, probably because of the CPD element. And this new, uh, there is a ring which comes up between the upper and the lower segment. This is seen on the abdomen as the bandel's ring. It is very commonly seen. And uh, we have a picture over here, which shows us the bandel's ring. Now what happens that these pains keep on increasing the uh, fundus, keep the upper segment keeps on contracting and retracting. So the bandel ring keeps on moving up and up and up. And what happens in the primary, some primary para, sometimes the pains uh, are quietened for some time and then you can always reassess, you know, but in a multi, the pains do not stop. They keep on and on and on. And the lower segment keeps on becoming distended and thinned out until finally there is rupture of the uterus. So this is the most common complication of this. So um, this I've talked about. Patient is in agony from continuous pain and discomfort, becomes restless, features of exhaustion, ketoacidosis, abdominal palpation reveals upper segment hard and tender, lower segment is distended and tender. So how do we prevent this? Partographic management of labor. Be very careful. Uh, Dr. Harish has talked about pelvic assessment. Be very careful that you're not missing a very big baby and uh, CPD. The pelvic may be all right. Pelvis may be all right, but it could be a fellow pelvic disproportion. So partographic management of labor, early diagnosis of malpresentation, disproportion, and LSCS can prevent this condition completely. So we must be very sure that rupture of the uterus has not taken place. Correct the dehydration and ketoacidosis, give pain relief, give antibiotics, LSCS is done. Now, if you are trying to do a destructive operation and take out the baby per vaginum, please be sure that the uterus has not ruptured, even in case of IUD. Now coming to coordinate uterine contractions, whereas the polarity is not maintained now and pacemaker foci are all over. So this usually appears in the phase of labor. The hypertonic state of the uterus arises from any of the conditions. We've talked about this, spastic lower uterine segment, colicky uterus, asymmetrical contraction, constriction ring, generalized tonic contraction, all these are collectively known as incoordinate uterine contraction. So what happens in increased frequency and or duration of the uterine contractions cause rise in the baseline tone. And what happens because of that, there's reduced circulation in the placental intervillous space. New pacemakers are there all over. Myometrium contracts spasmodically and regularly. These contraction forces they neither dilate the cervix nor push the fetus down. They're actually clamping on the baby. The uterine tone is elevated. Pain is present before, during, and after the contraction. So what happens? Fetal hypoxia. Placental abruption could also take place. And when you do a CTG, FHR shows reduced variability and late decelerations. Uterine hyperstimulation due to oxytocin are often associated with fetal tachycardia because of fetal stress. And the constriction ring, and these will be uh, dealt with separately. So we'll talk about the spastic lower segment. In this, there is uh, fundal dominance is lacking. The lower segment has become spastic. The pacemaker foci are in the lower segment. Now they are spastic, they are contracting, and the patient is having horrible pain in the low back. And there is inadequate relaxation in between the contractions. And basal tone is raised above the critical level of 20 mm of mercury. The patient is in agony. 
there are evidences of dehydration and ketoacidosis. Bladder is frequently distended and often there's retention of urine, distension of stomach, bowels, everything is visible. Premature attempts to bed on because she's going on having pains. Now what happens that you see that the uterus is very hard and tender and just touch the uterus, it becomes contractile and hardens up. Palpation of the fetal parts is difficult. If you do a pervaginal examination, you will see that the cervix is not applied to the presenting part. It is thick edematous, hanging loose, and absence of membranes could be there and meconium stained lichen. Fetal distress appears early due to placental insufficiency caused by inadequate relaxation of the uterus. There is no place of oxytocin augmentation. LSCS is the answer. And prior to the LSCS or along with it, correct the dehydration and ketoacidosis by rapidly infusing ringers lactate. Now constriction ring, also known as contraction ring or Schroeder's ring. This is different from Bangle's ring. It is one form of incoordinate uterine contraction in which the whole of the uterus undergoes a tonic contraction and retraction and there is a ring of circular muscle fibers of the uterus, which goes at the level of the upper and lower segment at a constricted part of the fetus. So normally where it is in the kephalic presentation, it is around the neck of the fetus. It can appear in all the stages of labor and usually it is reversible and complete. That is the ring is complete, but it is reversible. And why does it occur? Because of judicious administration of oxytocin, premature rupture of membranes, premature attempt at vagina instrumental delivery. Diagnosis is difficult. It's not seen per abdomen. It's revealed during LSCS when you're trying to take out the baby, you find that there is a you know ring preventing the baby's head coming out. In the second stage during uh, faucets application and uh, during MRP in the third stage. And the maternal condition is not much affected. What is affected is the fetus. And in this also, the uterus does not rupture. Delivery is just done by a cesarean. And how to relax this ring is by deepening the plane of anesthesia. Sometimes while you're doing a cesarean and the ring is holding back the head of the baby's head inside, you may have to make a vertical cut in the ring to deliver the uh, fetal head. So, and uh, difficulties faced during forceps or during MRP, they are relieved by giving the deeper plane of anesthesia. Now, coming to a very important part, cervical dystocia. Progressive cervical dilatation needs an effective uh, stretching because of the pressure of the presenting part. Failure of the cervical dilatation may be due to insufficient uterine contractions, malpresentations, malposition. And uh, of course, it could be because of CPD when the head is not being applied on the cervix. Cervical dystocia, therefore, could be primary or secondary. Primary is commonly observed when the external loss fails to dilate. Rigid cervix because of more fibrous tissue, insufficient uterine contraction. So uh, in the presence of associated uh, uh, symptoms, my, uh, uh, as complications like malpresentations, malposition, LSCS is preferred. If the head is sufficiently low down with only a thin rim of cervix left behind, the cervix, uh, some people try to push up the ring or you can give retraction to that ring by applying the ventus. In others, when the cervix is thinned out, the head is low down, but it's only half dilated. Dershen's incisions can be attempted at 2 and 10. Please do not give the Dershen incision at 3 and 9. Otherwise, torrential bleeding is going to follow. But remember that these incisions can extend up and then it is a big problem in repairing them. And if facilities are there for LSCS, then proceed with LSCS. Otherwise, if not, Dershen incisions can be tried, followed by forceps or ventus extraction and that is considered quite safe. Now secondary cervical dystocia is results because of excessive scarring or rigidity of the cervix because of the effect of previous operation or disease. 
others could be because of post delivery post operative scarring early cervical cancers procedures like leap and lets now we come to uterine tetany generalized tonic contractions in this condition the uterus contracts literally grasps the fetus the whole of the uterus is contracting and retracting there is no physiological differentiation of the upper and the passive lower segment the whole uterus undergoes a sort of tonic muscular spasm holding the uterus the fetus inside so there is no risk of rupture new pacemakers appear all over causes could be cpd obstruction judicious use of oxyto6 patient is in prolonged labor severe and continuous pain fetal parts are neither well defined nor is the fetal heart sound audible vaginal examination reveals a jammed head with big caped dry and limitous vagina correct dehydration give antibiotics adequate pain relief and if the hypercontractility has been because of oxytocin then we should we should stop that and we can resort to tocolytics cesarean section is done in major cases so now to conclude coordinate uterine action is a common complication of labor but is not always recognized it taxes the patients and endures uh, endurance of the pregnant woman its management calls for skill experience and judgment of the obstetrician not always anticipated or prevented early detection and treatment and shows a favorable outcome for mother and child lscs is frequently required uterus always behave somehow better in subsequent labors so in the first case if you have done a caesar tolac can always be tried in the next delivery thank you so much thank you for the wonderful talk ma'am <laughs> i would love to hear dr doshi's comments on this <laughs> sir you are muted you can mute yourself you are muted or i should ask you to send me the slides we have a mouse society thank you ma'am and absolutely right what sir said said Yes. i'm detailing all these contractions in such a beautiful way so that you yes. know we can clinically use them is <laughs> a key role and as you said yes lscs is the option for a safe mother and a child a uh, one thing ma'am i just want to ask you i mean if a patient is febrile i mean in a case who has come with infection or patient is febrile do we anticipate these kind of in incoordinated uterine contractions more or maybe i mean there are few tips which i would like you to share with all the uh, obstetricians here few clinical tips in which we can you know in hand think that okay this coordinated action can occur so what are those See, i uh, think what is very important is good clinical judgment by the obstetrician to begin with because you have to be very sure and dr doshi has given us a very good insight on uh, pelvimetry be very sure that you are not dealing with a case of mal presentation mal positions and above all cpd you know sometimes the pelvis is good but the baby is bigger the baby's head may be deflexed you know if it's not completely flexed if that uh, occipital post that diameter is not coming at occipital anterior then what is going to happen is that the bigger diameter is going to come or the head is transversely placed then we are going to uh, be in for serious trouble because we are not anticipating so the obstetrician should know how to evaluate the fontanelli the anterior fontanel there's the posterior fontanel whether the head is properly rotated it's flexed or not so uh, you know ekika what happens is that uh, uh, if the patient is febrile so uh, the patient is normally what dehydrated and you know exhausted so first get rid of that so uh, give her uh, paracetamol let her relax and uh, and after that i think it should proceed because otherwise she may slip into inertia yeah so probably ma'am in these patient we should not go for augmentation very hurriedly okay let's yeah augment. yeah 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 so probably we should let not her, augment let her yeah let her be in her phase let her go okay. into normal labor first and see what the labor is like yeah, i want to tell one thing yes. related to this uh, fever question 
but um, when i did my md it was md at that time it was the epidural analgesia and labor my th- subject of this okay. dissertation and then my five students have done it epidural analgesia painless labor can work in two ways it mm. correct it can correct your abnormal uterine action or sometimes it can lead to some abnormal or uterine relaxia re, um, inertia type of feature so to right. be very sure but it can go in either way and second thing for cervical reason as well as some abnormal uterine action tramadol i have done again the paper not the dissertation for my students 50 mg im 100 mg im comparison of two it works nicely when it relieves pain the contraction may not improve or whatever correct correctly but the cervix dilates very fast like your epidocine or drotin or right uh-huh. whatever you give for cervical relaxation so tramadol any pain i, I think you accept that is because the stress and anxiety exactly. is one of the exactly. most exactly. important causes of incontinence exactly. action yes exactly. so when the because stress is gone the patient relaxes and that is when uh, the proper See, I, polarity I, 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 and all comes up i'm talking with a patient i prove wrong i tell after before four hours that cervix is uh, dystocia cervix is not dilating we wait for a couple of hours and then we will do cesarean section and i give tramadol and then after two hours she delivers so it is like that that much totally changing the picture and sir one thing which i want to ask how much oxytocin should be i mean is is more how much is more that okay this much you have given because you find that the contractions are not sufficient and if you go above this it might lead to hypertonicity this also because sometimes patient comes to us in rural area they have been given two ampules of oxytocin stat im and then am, the patient comes to oh my oh it's my i am two ampules i am i am that also to argument and that to i am it is given and the patient comes totally locked up uterus dhar so this is what i would like to and then how to work on that sir then you have, have to give it. you have to give topolytics then yes i think giving the i am dose is too much it will not it will you are right people here also in periphery have a habit of when head is on perineum they give shot of i not I like when i am i am then the fetus baby comes out very fast but then once in a while it can rupture the uterus also you yes. mm. don't want yes. that big complication so that's why no, we no. never recommend before the delivery no. of the baby no i am no iv state iv drip is okay and then ah. depending upon the response because we cannot count the montevideo units right depending upon the response five units right 36 drops is my maximum limit 36 mm-hmm. drops that's it that's it right. yes because they will go into hypertonic action yeah. so ma'am you see some and you have to be very careful na uh, because some uh, patients are more sensitive to oxytocin so than yes. others individual we uh, should use so the very individual patient to patient <laughs> variation yes. is there Well, that's why they've been giving us an escalating dose, you know, with yeah. the drop to keep on increasing to so find out the yeah. sensitivity. Yeah. Well, most of the time in this rural area, just to augment labor, what they'll do, they'll give I am ampule one ampule oxytocin. They'll wait for two three hours. Again, they will repeat it. No. And then when the patient is totally in distress and they find that <laughs> nothing is happening, they will send it. Patient I comes know. to us absolutely hypertonic uterus. <laughs> No, so I this think is what, oh, that is why. One comment because in rural area they may not be preserving the freeze, so whatever no. oxytocin they are giving, they may be affecting less. <laughs> yeah, that was the action thing. They are lessening in disguise. You have, you were <laughs> actually, actually caught. Actually, you're right. Yeah, Otherwise, that must be the action. Otherwise, it would have come ruptured to us. You're right. No, if they if they don't <laughs> have fridge, then probably you will not get ruptured. It may not act on okay. you. So, <laughs> half of the half of the people using here oxytocin. Don't keep it in fridge. In I fridge. didn't vouch on that on this one. But the potency is decreased. Don't keep it in fridge. Potency is decreased. Lumbot, somewhat, not twenty thirty. Ah, uh, somewhat, somewhat, huh? Yes, Ranjana, madam, lovely talk. I think the whole uh, this whole webinar was so good. It focused on the three P's, you know, the <laughs> the passenger, the passage, which uh-huh. Dr. Harish Doshi said, then the. the pa- Singer and the power which you said and the power that was real good. <laughs> I power. Yes, so she, 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 she has kept nice the power with herself only. only. Yes. <laughs> Ranjana has kept the power with herself only. Yes, <laughs> and that is showing the power. You know, the power is with her. <laughs> so I think it was really nice and uh, great talks. I mean, sitting right from the beginning till the end. Listen Thank you so much, Doctor Harish, for uh, staying till the end. Thank and you, Anna. No, no, I have to. I am very much interested. 
and excited to listen both your talk and Jairani's talk. The bridge I'm Jairani gave a wonderful talk. Jairani is super. She was also nice. so wonderful. All talks were so wonderful, you know. <laughs> it it actually like we how you see you know, obstetrics run in our blood, na. So we will sit, we are glued to our sit right seats right from the beginning. I mean, all the three topics are so clinically interesting topic that everyone is glued to it. And very beautifully explained by all our three learned stalwart speakers. <laughs> lot of wisdom points we got. This is Corona gift. Virtually, you can discuss this in a medical Actually, college. This if is I can read, gift, yeah. half of the PGs will not come in my lecture. <laughs> in medical college, the PGs yeah. will not attend fully because breach cesarean section, breach cesarean section. They are not interested. <laughs> here, here, this platform, you are nicely covering this. Good. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, Nice one, nice. Thank so you. There's one question in the question box. Uh, this is for Harish Doshi, sir. When yes. should we do pelvic assessment in a case we are trying for trial of labor after cesarean? In a tri trial of labor after cesarean? Both. After 37 weeks, because in a TOLEC we are less doing nowadays. I, I, I would say in a private, most of the people are doing repeat cesarean section. In a medical college, we do dissertation also. But after and also it is a, an ongoing process during the labor also you assess the pelvis once again as well as the progress of labor right dilatation and descent both so that is first because you have to plan if it is a really borderline pelvis is a criteria against toleg toleg will should have a good pelvis average size baby vertex presentation right full term and no patient consent and facility for cesarean section these are all six basic criteria of prerequisites for TOLIC. So that assessment should be prior. But even that is good in labor because of deflection, because of oxyproposterior, you may end up in a trouble. So that's why it is a both, I would say, first after 37 weeks and then uh, in labor if you have decided if you're... for TOLIC. So after this enriching scientific webinar, I think it's time for a vote of thanks. Dr. Dipika, do you want to share your... Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot to all the experts and the attendees present today. And uh, for the uh, topic, of course, you people do require progesterone and supplementations. And we have our new uh, didrogestron uh, tablet, which is not really new now, uh, about a year old. This is uh, our own API, which is a fully indigenized micronized didrogestron by the name Divatron, Divatron 10MG tablets, supports natural and artificial conception. The product has also, the product has also uh, been awarded uh, AVAX Marketing We also have injection maintain 500-250MG hydroxyprogesterone caproate. Lycoret, the ultimate cell protector, which has natural lycopene as lycomato available in our lycoret preg sachet of L-arginine, DHA and lycopene for high-risk pregnancies in orange flavor. So we thank you all very much and we would love to see you again. This Monday we have a um, PG forum which is on antipartum hemorrhage. The PGs from Dean Dial Hospital of Delhi will be presenting case presentation. And so do <laughs> We are very thankful to ICOG for granting us this time three uh, ICOG points. Yes, ma'am. So I will propose the vote of thanks. My gratitude and sincere thanks to our chief guest, Dr. Anuradha Khanna, ma'am, President UPCOG, for sparing her valuable time and blessing the webinar. My gratitude and thanks to our speakers, Dr. Ranjana Khanna, ma'am, Dr. Harish Toshi, sir, Dr. K.S. Jairani Kamraj, ma'am, for their wonderful, wonderful talks. We all are living richer in knowledge. Uh, thank you to all our chairpersons, Dr. Sunita Tendulwarkar, ma'am, Dr. Kundavi Shankar, ma'am, Dr. Komal, ma'am, Dr. Urvashi, ma'am, Dr. Chitra Pandey, ma'am, Dr. Kusum, ma'am, for their expert comments and valuable inputs. My uh, heartfelt thanks to Allahabad and Mao Ops and Gaini Society for joining hands with us. And especially thanks to Dr. Shubha Pandey, ma'am, Dr. Uma Jaiswal, ma'am, Dr. Kusum, and Dr. Ekika Singh. 
Uh, my thanks. We have, all, we have also been joined by the OBGYN societies of Southern India. Okay. OGSSI. Okay. And Ekika has been a wonderful inputter too. Thank you very much, ma'am. It's always a delight to hear you. Okay. My special thanks to ICOG for always granting us ICOG credit points. My thanks to Dr. Amita Tripathi, ma'am, my co-convener for smooth functioning of the webinar. And last but not the least, Dr. Jackson Paul Pharmaceuticals and Dr. Deepika, our constant academic partner. Thank you. Thank and you very much. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot.